There's so much to do, more than we can possibly squeeze into a 24 hour day or even a seven day week. How can we get it all done? Do you ever feel like you're fighting against the clock, constantly in a hurry, whipsawed from one activity to another, just trying to keep your head above water? But what if it doesn't have to be this way? What if your life, your pace, the way you show up in the world, what if it can all be different? The truth is, God designed it to be different. God has a better rhythm in mind, a more joyful and life-giving rhythm. It's called Sabbath. Sabbath not just as one day a week, but as a way of life, as an orientation of the heart. Anybody, am I good? Anybody else uh, watch that and wonder who's driving the car? No? Okay. Hopefully not the person doing the video. Well, good morning, uh, Trinity Hospers. I was trying to remember when the last time I was that was here. I think it was last spring that I was here last, so it's really great to, to be back with you. Um, if you don't know me, my name is uh, Kristen Brower and... I used to be on staff at Trinity, and now I'm the Director of Discipleship at, Tr at Northwestern College. We're going to be taking a look today at this idea of Sabbath as you're in the middle of a series on Sabbath, and today's sermon is entitled, Practicing Freedom from Slavery. So when, when I kept hearing this, when Pastor Kurt's like, here's the title of this sermon and here's the passage, I don't know if, if it, has anyone seen the movie Braveheart? Yeah, two. We got it. So, I, I used to be a history teacher, so thing, movies like Braveheart I, I really enjoy. And Braveheart is this like fully throated, red-blooded like battle epic um, about William Wallace, who's a legendary uh, Scot warrior who led the nation in, into battle against the English. But at the end of the film, um, Mel Gibson plays uh, William Wallace, and, and he says, you come to fight and free men you are. Uh, what will you do with this freedom? Will you fight? And basically they're all like, mm, I think I'm going to run the other way. I don't really want to go run and die. And then he continues and he's like, tell our enemies that they may take our lives, but they can never take our freedom. And there's this really great ending where Mel Gibson is in the hands of the English. He's at the brink of his death and getting killed. And he, they give him one last word to say. With, and with all of his energy and all of his breath he has left, he just screams freedom. Like at the top of his lungs, his, his face is painted. And I kept hearing that, practicing freedom from slavery and just that idea of William Wallace, Mel Gibson yelling, freedom. Now picture me not with William Wallace giving, screaming this to his army, but God saying this to each of us. Every time we come into Sabbath, he's like, freedom! And the Lord says to us, you come and fight as free men and women, and free men and women you are. What will you do with this freedom? Will you fight? And so as we, we look at the passage today, we're going to talk about what it means to be free and how we can fight for our freedom in the idea of Sabbath. And so we're going to be reading from Deuteronomy chapter 5 this morning. As we come to the word, would you pray with me? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we thank you that your word is living and active and sharper than any double-edged sword. God, we thank you that you give us words to be able to help challenge us and transform us and to make us more like you. So the may the meditations of all of our hearts and the words of my mouth be pleasing unto you, our rock and our redeemer. In your name we pray, amen. So on the slides I have Deuteronomy 5 verses 1 through 21, um, which I'm going to mess you up, Caleb, sorry. Um, we're just going to focus on verses 12 through 15. So hear the word of the Lord from Deuteronomy chapter 5, verses 12 through 15. 
It says, observe the Sabbath day and keep it holy as the Lord your God commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter or your male or female slave or your ox or your donkey or any of your livestock or the resident alien in your towns so that your male and female slave may rest as well as you. Remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt and the Lord your God brought you out from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. This is the word of the Lord. So the Israelites are God's people and they knew what it was like to be held captive. They were held captive by the cruel hands of the Egyptian taskmasters and their captivity lasted for over four centuries. Four centuries, which is 400 years. And, and they worked in the shadow of the Egyptian pyramids and to the angry crack of bull whips, they were forced to toil away as slaves for the prosperity of Pharaoh. Seven days a week they labored with no rest, which means they did not have a day to, to worship God. They, they worked until their backs ached and their hands throbbed and blistered and bloody they worked for 400 years. And then one day, God answered their call to be rescued. Through the most unlikely of heroes, a, a runaway shepherd named Moses, God announces that he will set his people free. And a showdown between Pharaoh and God began. And God ensues involving ten terrible plagues. And finally, Pharaoh begrudgingly yields to Moses' demand and he let God's people go. But just as God's people are making their exodus to freedom, Pharaoh changes his mind. He sends his army chasing after them, and the Hebrews are terrified. God tells them not to be afraid, and they reach the banks of the Red Sea, and God does the impossible. He splits the mighty waters of the sea, creating a path of dry ground with a monstrous wall of surging water on each side. Moses and the people then walk through, and when Pharaoh and his army, boiling with anger, come charging at the sea bank, they pursue the Israelites on the path of dry ground. But once all the Israelites have safely made it to the other side, God removes his hand and the walls of the water collapse, swallowing the Egyptian army up, and God's people are finally free. The Hebrews' 400 years of darkness and captivity and lacking freedom is now over. But they also knew the joy of being rescued. God commanded them to never forget that they were once slaves who by the strength of God's outstretched hand have now been set free. Keeping and practicing Sabbath was one of the primary practices that God's people kept from forgetting their freedom. Exodus 20 and Deuteronomy 5 both speak of Sabbath keeping as the fourth commandment, but they're different. Pastor Kurt preached on this a few weeks ago. Listen to the differences in the passage and hear what I mean. Here's what the fourth commandment says in Exodus chapter 20. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, but rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. And in Deuteronomy 5, the passage we just read, it says this, Remember that you were slaves in Egypt, and that the Lord your God brought you out of there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God has commanded you to observe the Sabbath day. In Exodus 20, we see grounds of Sabbath in creation. We hear the pattern of the six days of work and one day off rest after God, our creator. It's based in creation. 
But in Deuteronomy 5, it's grounds for liberation. It talks about freedom and God's saving act of delivering his people from the Egyptian taskmasters. Deuteronomy's reason for Sabbath is that you were once slaves. Slaves had no rest. You had to work. You had no choice. But God delivered you from slavery. He set you free to worship and serve him alone. The Hebrews watched their taskmasters drown in the Red Sea. It's like, now you can take a day of rest. You are not slaves anymore. God removed from the yoke. Don't go back. We don't have to go back to Egypt. You're not slaves anymore. So a Sabbath heart is about practicing freedom from slavery. We take rest because we are not in Egypt anymore. The new Moses and Jesus who brought a new exodus and, and through today we are not slaves in Egypt. We can all face another kind of slavery. One that in some ways can be just as oppressive. Sabbath is a celebration of freedom from all of the things that keep us in bondage. On Sabbath, we are reminded that there is freedom from sin. We're not in our own power, but in the power of God, which is offered to us by faith. We are also reminded that in this freedom, it's freedom we didn't earn. The firstborn Hebrew children were saved by the blood of the lamb smearing on the doorposts of the, the evening before the exodus from Egypt. Sabbath is a freedom from all things that keep us in bondage. But what are the things that keep us in bondage? Maybe a, a better way of asking that question is what are the things that hold us captive? What are the things that keep us from being free? Who are the pharaohs in our life? Or who are our taskmasters? Anyone who overworks is really a slave. Anyone who cannot rest from work is a slave. Maybe to a need for success, to a materialistic culture, to paternal expectations, to a frantic controlling schedule, to homework, to people-pleasing, needing to prove yourself, or maybe it's just believing lies about yourself. The taskmaster will abuse you if you're not disciplined in the practice of Sabbath. Because Sabbath is a declaration of freedom. The Sabbath is, is mo about more than just an external rest of the body. It's about an inner rest of the soul. We need rest from the anxiety and the strain of overwork, which I think really is an attempt to justify ourselves to, to gain money, to, to gain status, to gain reputation, to gain approval or maybe to gain a reputation we think we have to have. Too often, the things of our everyday life can hold us captive. They can paralyze us. It, it can cause us to feel stuck. And avoiding overwork requires deep rest in Christ's finished work for our, your salvation. Jesus gives us rest that no one else will. The purpose of Sabbath is, is not simply to rejuvenate yourself in order to do more production, nor is it the pursuit of pleasure. The purpose of Sabbath is to enjoy your God, life in general, what you have accomplished in the world through his help, and the freedom you have in the gospel. The freedom from slavery to any material object or human expectation. Just like the people in, in Deuteronomy, we have been saved by the blood of the Lamb. And we're now to walk in freedom that is ours in Christ Jesus. We too have been saved by the blood of the Lamb and are now to walk in the freedom that is ours in Christ Jesus. 
We are people who can live as those set free. Free from sin, free from death, free from the power of darkness. And the beautiful thing about Sabbath and having a Sabbath heart is that it creates intimacy with Jesus. It, it's not a day or moments of inactivity, but rather a day of celebration. So whether we practice Sabbath small moments throughout the week or large chunks of time on the weekend, every time we practice Sabbath, we aren't just stopping, we're not just resting, but we are expressing our celebration of our freedom. Sabbath is the day when, like William Wallace or Mel Gibson in Braveheart, we get to scream, Freedom! Freedom from the weak. The ancient 20th century theologian Karl Barth says this, The Sabbath is the day we are to celebrate, rejoice, and be free to the glory of God. We can stop our work right smack dab in the middle of it, even though there remains much to get done, without apology and without guilt, simply because we are free. No one but God is master over us. No one but God is master over us, which means we are not captive to a frantic schedule. We are not captive to other people's opinions of us which also means we're not captive by lies we believe about ourselves that don't get any place in us. We are not captive to be human doings because God created us to be human beings. He's created us to be. And so Sabbath is not stopping and resting, but it's also the time and place that creates intimacy with God. And one of the times spent in intimacy with Jesus, we're reminded what our identity comes in and not what we do. I think this is, this is the thing that I often have to remind myself. My identity comes in Jesus and not what I do. Not in what others say about us, not in the lies we believe. Intimacy at Sabbath reminds us who we are and whose we are. Sabbath is kind of a way of restoring the factory settings. Right? You, you maybe have to do that with your phone sometimes, restore it back to factory settings or restore things back to how they once were. I feel like that's how Sabbath is. It's that tweaking of, hey, remember who you are and whose you are. You've lived this frantic day. Just give me a little piece to, to tune us back to who I am and who I say you are. You've lived this frantic week. Oh, let me just fine-tune you and set you back to default settings of who you are and whose you are. Because I think the busyness of our lives can often cause us to disconnect from the purpose we were created for. I can say from experience as someone who has run far down that weary road, this is the quickest way to live in misery. I remember my second year of teaching when I lived in Pella. I said yes to way too many things and found myself in the ICU in November. It was actually, it was a really expensive gift from the Lord, being in the ICU for three days, but it was the Lord's way of saying, hey, you need to slow down. You need to not say yes to too many things. You need to maybe check the pace that you're running at. And when you're laying in a hospital bed for three days, there's really not a whole lot else to do other than talk to the Lord and process maybe some ways that life needs to change. I ran far too, f down, far too far down the weary road, which is the quickest way to live in misery. The Sabbath is a day to recognize that God didn't create us to accomplish tasks, but to be in love with him. That is our purpose. 
God created us as human beings and not human doings. We were created first and foremost for God. I think Sabbath also is this, this countercultural declaration of trust. I don't rest because everything is done. I rest because God has promised that if I do it, he will make up for the rest. As the Israelites trusted that they were to reflect on the new relationship with God, in in Egypt they had been slaves and now they were sons and daughters. Like we just sang about. They they had been under this, this cruel reign of Pharaoh and now they were under the tender care of their father. A father that they could trust. I kind of wonder when they were wandering in the wilderness and he's like, hey, just leave the manna, collect it for, for two days. I wonder if they were tempted to take more than they needed when he's like, there'll be enough. Because I think often when we live in, in the slave taskmaster mindset, it, it takes a lot for us when we're free and not living in that to be able to change our thinking on how we operate. I'd love to say after my visit to the ICU, I changed my thinking right away, but it still took time. It's still taking time. But this is our Sabbath truth today, still, like the the Egyptians, or like the Israelites. Stop thinking like slaves and start thinking like sons and daughters. Take some time to to recognize and reflect on the blessing that God is the point. That God is the provider and God alone is Savior. But if you are like me, maybe you're like, there's no way I can just sit down and do nothing. Right? The shame and the guilt would, would feel too much that you should be doing things. And then the questions come, well, what if I just do this? Or who's going to do this if, if I just take this break? But here, here's the thing we're finding in this series is Sabbath. God told us we can. Why rest? Because God told us we can. Actually, we should. Why say no? God told me I can. Because the heart of Deuteronomy 5 is the Hebrew people being let go to worship. Let them go so they can worship me. Only God can rid us of the taskmasters. Our part is to trust. And and Kurt talked about this a couple weeks ago, but the father's gift is to indulge his children. Sabbath is, I see, is this giant wrapped gift that many of us choose not to open each week. What if you had a Christmas present that's still not opened? Right? That, that seems crazy. God gives us this gift of Sabbath, and, and some of us choose not to open it. And opening the gift of Sabbath, whether on Sunday or Saturday or small Sabbaths throughout the week, it's a holy expression of God's love for us. It's a gift that our, our good Father wrapped up and says, You matter so much to me that I'm not willing to allow you to work your fingers to the bone any longer. Therefore, I've established this time of no labor so that you can relax and be refueled by learning in my, leaning in my presence. I want you to sleep in late, which there's a lot of guilt about that sometimes. Have extra time around the dinner table with laughing and lingering with friends and family. God is saying, you're my beloved, and every single moment of your life exists under the canopy of my grace. But you need to take regular breaks from your busyness to focus on me and my gifts in order to remember that. After being freed from slavery in Egypt, Sabbath became an every week opportunity for the Israelites to proclaim freedom. It was also how God's people got in a rhythm with God's heart for Israel. But the reality is the Sabbath also isn't just for us. 
Sabbath keeping is an act of worship. It's an act of loving God. In fact, Genesis 2 verse 3 says this, God blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy because on it he rested. This is the first time the word holy is used in the Bible. Holiness is, is used in the Bible first to talk about rest. So when people say busyness is next to holiness, it's actually wrong. Rest is next to holiness in Scripture. And, and being whole means being at rest and being at peace. There's two other Hebrew words that strike me being related to this notion of Sabbath. The first is, is shalom, which means peace or wholeness. So when, when Jews approach Sabbath day, they say Shabbat Shalom, which can translate easily as have a peaceful Sabbath. But the deeper meaning of it is something more like may you find wholeness as you cease your work. Shabbat Shalom, may you have wholeness as you cease from work. The other Hebrew term is Shema. The, the Hebrew word for hear. It's the, the first word of the greatest commandment. Hear, O Israel. Shema, O Israel. The, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. The last thing God created before he rested was us. Which means our first day on earth, Adam and Eve's first day on earth was God's Sabbath. Which means the first thing we did as human beings, as creatures, was to take a day off with God. Not because God was tired, but because that is what he called whole and holy and good. I found this description of that idea uh, in my reading, and, and a mom described it this way. She says, when our baby was born, the doctor lifted her from my body and handed her directly into my arms. They immediately laid her on my chest so that the first thing my child heard, Shema, was her mama's heartbeat and her mama's voice. And her whole job in that moment, the, the whole job of her newborn baby was to listen and to rest and attach. Which is to say, our first day on earth, God ceased work, Shabbat Shalom, and our whole job was to listen, Shema, to rest, and attach. I think this is still our Sabbath work today. How beautiful this, this gift of Sabbath is. But Sabbath isn't just for us. And it also isn't just for loving God. Sabbath also teaches us not to harvest to the margins, which means it, it teaches us to love others. We see this in the book of Leviticus. It begins as a habit of harvest. The, the Israelites are told not to harvest their fields to the edges so that there would be food enough left for the poor to come along behind and glean. They talk about this in the book of Ruth as well, where they, they leave room on the edges of the field so that people who don't have can eat too. In Leviticus chapter 25, when we get more detailed description of Sabbath years and, and Jubilee years, all throughout, sprinkled reminders to take care of the poor. This, I believe, is, is the, distinguishes someone who just wants a day off or who doesn't even want a day off and, and resets the time they have to take for others from maybe someone who has heard God's heartbeat, has heard the voice of God for the least and the last and the lost. It is there that there is room for others in their lives. Because when we harvest to the margin, we have no energy for the poor and the ones who require extra grace. When we harvest to the margins, it's hard to be present to the people in front of us. When we harvest to the margins, there, there's no place left or bandwidth for things that break God's heart. 
Because Jesus himself said it is okay to do good on the Sabbath, but we can only do good when we have room left at the margins, when those moments for mercy emerge. Sabbath gives room to be present to people. This resonates a lot with me because I, I'm a natural introvert, and so I need time alone. And often jobs in church or jobs at the college where I have a glass window for an office, uh, people see you all the time. There's a lot of extroverting. But if I don't take the introvert time or the small Sabbath times or the small Sabbaths or a Sabbath on the weekend, I can't be present to people. I don't have extra grace for people. And so Sabbath gives us room to be present with people. It gives us room to help us love others. It teaches us not to harvest to the margin so that we have leftovers to be able to love and be present to those around us. And then let me close with this. Just, just a little highlight for what's coming later in this series. But this moved me. While our human tendency is to want to escape, the kingdom call is the invitation to rest. In other words, rest is the biblical corrective to our inclination towards escape. Paul told the Colossians that Sabbath is a shadow, a vague glimpse of what is ahead for us in the kingdom of God. And this is the part that moved me, which means when we practice Sabbath well, we are practicing heaven. I've never thought of it that way. When we practice Sabbath well, we are practicing heaven. By practicing he Sabbath, we find ourselves what is most real, which is Jesus. When we practice Sabbath, we, we find what we proclaim, what we're practicing of who we're becoming, what's making us whole, which is Jesus. When we practice Sabbath, we're proclaiming what is real and important to us, which is freedom in Jesus. So Sabbath is the practice of becoming whole. Sabbath is the practice of listening to the heart of God, but Sabbath is also the practice of freedom. Let's pray. God, our Father, Jesus, our Savior, and Holy Spirit, our guide, we thank you for this gift of Sabbath. God, we thank you that we get to declare and scream freedom in celebration of not only what you did for the Hebrews thousands of years ago, but God, what you do for us. God, we pray that we can find moments in our day and in our week to be able to help us live in freedom from the taskmasters. God, the things that hold us captive. God, whether that's the opinions of other people, whether that's our work. God, whether that's addictions we have. God, the things that hold us bondage and hold us captive. We proclaim freedom over them through your blood, Jesus. And God, we pray that Sabbath inspires us not just to, to reset and find intimacy with you, God. But God, I pray that it inspires us to love others. That it inspires us to practice heaven. That it's moments where we get to worship you. So God, we thank you for this gift of Sabbath. God, I, I pray and I challenge myself and all of us here, God, that we can continually find those reset factory settings back to you, back to you, back to you. In your name we pray, amen. So I, I'm just going to invite you guys to just reflect a little. Um, before we, we sing our last song, just to, to take some space on maybe what's keeping you from Sabbath. Who are the taskmasters or the things that hold you captive or bondage in your life? What do you find yourself a slave to that maybe God's asking you to, to tweak or to
or to change or to adjust a little bit. So just take some time to process with the Lord uh, before we sing.